so good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started. Um, I want to welcome you to the uh, Health Law Institute seminar series, um, and to acknowledge first uh, that we were uh, that we are on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, and we honor the Mi'kmaq people who have taken care of this land, uh, and we acknowledge that we live and create on these lands in the spirit of taking care of them for all. My name is Joanna Erdman, and I'm the Associate Director of the Health Law Institute here at Dalhousie. Um, and I want to welcome you again to our seminar series. This is a series uh, that's really a platform for sharing uh, research and ideas on uh, health law and policy. And it's uh, my real pleasure to introduce two of Dalhousie's own who are here with us um, today, uh, Professor uh, Catherine Ma from the Faculty of Health and um, Professor Jamie Baxter from the Faculty of Law. Um, they are a rather perfect pairing of health and law for our series. Um, and they will share some ideas on scale and community uh, health in food law. And it was uh, labeled here an armchair uh, conversation uh, between law and public health. And I note that the chairs have no arms. But indeed, I think they'll make it work. So uh, yeah, join me in welcoming them. Uh, thanks, Joanna. Uh, uh, thanks to you. Thanks to the Health Law Institute for having us uh, today. Um, so, uh, Kathy and I, uh, when we got together to talk about this uh, this talk, we kind of envisioned it in the nature of a, an armchair conversation, and, and I think, kind of true to form, um, that's what we're really hoping it'll it'll be. Um, and so, um, we kind of have a set of questions that that we uh, threw around uh, and talked about before this, um, and we're going to sort of use uh, those uh, in a couple of case studies. Uh, to really kind of tackle this question about uh, when we use law uh, to promote health and reduce nutritional disparities, how should we determine the appropriate scale um, of those uh, interventions, regulations, and so forth. So um, maybe just by way of introduction, I'll just say a couple of things to frame what it is we're going to talk about. Um, one of them has to do uh, with the kind of food law piece, and one of them has to do with scale. So um, uh, as Joanna said, this is kind of a nice pairing for us because I'm a law person, but not a health law person, um, in fact, in my training. Uh, Kathy is a, a, a physician and a, and a public health researcher, uh, and so it's really an attempt to kind of talk across, I guess, disciplinary boundaries and, um, and kind of fields uh, about some of the questions that we're both interested in, which both center around food in particular. Uh, and food law is a kind of, uh, I guess, burgeoning area within sort of the legal field that's really connected, I think, uh, in a very disciplinary way to others who are interested in food. Um, and we have a lot of questions within that community about how to define that as a legal field, and, and these questions around scale have, have in part become central to kind of thinking through some of those questions. There was a conference in November in Toronto um, in which that was the major theme of, of that particular conference, which kind of spurred us to think about this theme. The other just kind of framing piece is, is why we're talking about scale and what we mean you know, when we say scale as a kind of basis for this conversation. Um, and I think the upside, as you may see, is we don't actually have a precise definition for you about scale, and in fact, there may be different ways of thinking about that concept from a legal perspective and from a public health perspective. Um, but a couple of basic points might just help us all kind of have common ground. One is that we kind of use, and this is kind of trading on how geographers tend to think about these concepts, the ideas of space, kind of physical space is really important to scale, but also time. So we can think about different scales of space, you know, zooming in, zooming out um, at, uh, on physical space, and as well time, shorter durations of time and longer durations of time. Uh, and the scale dimensions of that. We can also, I think, think about um, quantitative scale, the kind of Google map version that you can focus in on a particular house or neighborhood or way out on a world map, um, but also this idea of uh, qualitative scale, that there's a real difference from even understanding um, you know, a city, for example, by looking at a map of that city, uh, or reading a travel writer's narrative description of that, walking around that city at eye level, right? The same area of the world, as it were, but from very different quality of perspectives and what that scale sort of means. So just to give you a couple of ways to think of that, and then Kathy has some points about um, public health. So. Oh, and yeah. also just for the, and so first of all, thank you for uh, having me over here today. Um, just to go on to what you were saying in terms of some uh, initial concepts, for anyone who does have a health or public health background or has been in my epidemiology class, um, the, tr the classic epidemiological triad is person, come on, cite it with me, person, <laughs> place, and time, which are kind of the three parameters by which we think of how to describe populations, uh, collect data around populations, and think also about the interventions uh, that we might put in place to improve the health of those populations. Okay, great. Um, so, do you want to talk a bit about the next? Yeah. Okay. 
So I'm going to start with just a few assumptions uh, just at the front because I thought, you know, we're going to, I think we're going to roam pretty far and wide with this conversation. Uh, so I thought we'd all start from a common starting point. So the first uh, piece of it is that diet-related factors now comprise the leading uh, risk factor for death and disability globally. And it's nearly, it's one or two in Canada uh, over the last decade or so, um, uh, only related to tobacco, which sometimes uh, supersedes it. So the first assumption is that we believe this is true and that we, we've read the health evidence on it. And the second is that we're all interested uh, in achieving a state of health. So we also take that as a, as a starting point, that that's a common uh, interest of us all in the room. Uh, the second thing is that there is a presence that we take as true that there is a presence of disparities. Uh, in health as well as opportunities to achieve health when we're talking about uh, society or our community environments and economies. Uh, and that the third thing is that those economies and environments are something that we have put in place through collective action but that themselves have characters and features uh, as opportunity structures outside of the humans that operate uh, inside them. Okay. Okay, so uh, some of these ideas that we're going to start with in terms of you know, scale and space and time and so forth um, seem kind of pretty abstract and conceptual, and probably that's what's kind of interesting and cool about them. But in order to kind of bring that down to earth, we also thought it would be helpful to talk about a couple of kind of tangible case studies in which, um, you know, kind of law has tried to um, uh, intervene and, and, and produce good health outcomes uh, and, and how scale has really influenced, um, you know, how we've approached those, how they've been resolved or not, and so forth. And so maybe we'll just do a brief description of those cases before we kind of keep Yeah, the absolutely. Um, so the first one that we're really highlighting is the recently failed federal Senate bill, uh, S228, uh, which is a marketing to kids uh, restriction. Uh, this died on the order paper just prior to the election in 2019, uh, so we're going to unearth that a little bit. Uh, there are two versions of the bill, so anyone who is a student and law student in this uh, audience here today has had the benefit of receiving the readings in advance. Uh, so you've, you will have seen the two versions of the bill, and we're going to debate uh, whether they went in the right direction, the wrong direction, uh, with the alterations to the bill, uh, etc. And then, as a kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, alternative kind of way of thinking about scale to this kind of problem, we have a kind of match a case, as it were, a recent case coming out of Montreal, in which um, uh, there the municipal government enacted a set of. Uh, land use control zoning restrictions uh, on uh, fast food restaurants in proximity to schools. Uh, and so, you know, if you think about the, the, the basic kind of policy problem as being uh, how to uh, regulate kids' access to or exposure to unhealthy foods or, 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 or knowledge or advertising of those, um, one way to think through that from a scale perspective uh, is uh, uh, according to jurisdictional scale, right? That uh, on the Senate bills, the unhealthy advertising regulations uh, were a matter of kind of federal regulation. Um, the recent case in Montreal, in which these zoning regulations were upheld by the Quebec Superior Court, uh, is one of local government law. And so, one of the ways in which we'll talk about scale and think about scale is as a jurisdictional matter between you know local law, national law. Of course, we can also think about the kind of global dimension of that. The second case study then is um, a second set of kind of parallels on the national and local uh, is a set of regulations around uh, shark finning um, uh, or restrictions on shark finning, um, a practice that uh, particular animal rights activists and, and animal lawyers uh, have kind of long advocated for restrictions on uh, through a set of kind of failed federal initiatives to, to, to have a ban on the import and export of uh, shark fins um, uh, enacted at the federal level that had failed. Uh, and then in 2011, the Toronto City Council enacted a ban on the possession, uh, consumption, and, and um, sale of, of shark fin products within uh, the Toronto municipality in the city of Toronto. Now, shark fins are, 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 are often uh, a culinary item. They're eaten as a kind of specialty item um, uh, to make, in particular, shark fin soup. Uh, and uh, Toronto's then enacted this ban to try to prevent uh, those practices as well as any transactions around shark fins. That ban was struck down but the Ontario Superior Court as being outside of the jurisdiction of the local government of Toronto. Uh, and then in 2000, uh, just last year, uh, uh, in the summer, we get a successful federal ban on shark finning um, that finally goes through um, in, in Parliament. Okay, so again, the dynamics between, you know, kind of federal and local. 
And then for uh, both sets of those themes, so around the scale of the governance, but in terms of thinking about federal and local, as well as the potential uh, interventions or infringements upon uh, the players at hand, we've also unearthed, and we'll talk a little bit about the classic charter case, uh, Irwin Toy, that upheld uh, Quebec's restriction on advertising uh, to children. So Quebec is the only jurisdiction in Canada to have a substantive uh, piece of legislation that restricts all commercial advertising directed towards children. So notably, this is not all food advertising, it's all advertising period. It's specifically defined as advertising in our own toy um, and in the legislation. And uh, we're going to talk about kind of how uh, Irwin Toy holds up now in the face of contemporary evidence as well as our understanding uh, of marketing and, and what it is and how it affects children and children's health. And then the last one, which we may or may not get to, but as a, a kind of a third area that we often uh, think a lot about in terms of scale issues and, and, and health outcomes, is the area of food safety. Um, and, and just last year, um, the, the federal government passed the Safe Food for Canadians uh, uh, food regulations, which are a kind of um, omnibus attempt to bring together several different <coughs> regulatory regimes uh, and regulate health, uh, uh, food safety um, across several different kind of areas of food uh, uh, processing and production and, 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 uh, and provision and so forth. Um, and so if we have time, we, we may come back to that one. And this one, the last one is also a little bit near and dear to both of us mm -hmm. as uh, people who are kind of heavily invested in our local food system and food enterprises. Um, a lot of our research in the Food Policy Lab and Health is about uh, retail food environments, so uh, small and large uh, retail food businesses and how they might be differentially affected by policy and the law. So this kind of leads us to thinking uh, kind of different three different categories we're going to use to try to run these case studies. One is the kind of jurisdictional question, so thinking about scale and how it relates to legal jurisdiction. Um, the second is the question of scale and scope of the intervention and the different dimensions that could comprise, you know, within let's say any level of jurisdiction, how we might you know regulate or or, or intervene to um, address these challenges. And then finally, as Kathy mentioned, the idea of scale of enterprise. When we think about um, you know, who is the kind of regulatory subject, how does um, the size, uh, how does an economy of scale, how does the size of business from big to small, from national or global to local, impact the way that we, um, that we, that we regulate or intervene? And this is very much thinking in progress. The, the kind of driver for this format is that Jamie and I sat down together to start talking about these various issues. We realized that we both unearthed this, our personal knowledge uh, and research knowledge of these cases. And I thought, you know, oh, I really enjoy just talking to Jamie as a lawyer about this. So I hope that I can kind of ask Jamie some questions in front of you all, and for the record, I'm recording no less. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then conversely, um, I have some questions for Kathy as a you know as a vision of public health professional, and so the idea is to kind of you know just kind of talk back and forth a little bit about um, how to figure these things out. We don't have um, a particular set of answers or insights for you, um, but hopefully the discussion itself will be helpful. Yeah. Great. Good. All right. Do you want to start there? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of scale of governance, um, I think there's several different ways that we can probably think about um, how you know scale of governance and this question of jurisdiction um, really kind of plays out. But one thing maybe that we can start by talking a little bit about and, and, and thinking about the, the, the child advertising regulations mm -hmm. and this local land use case I talked about it in Montreal um, is sort of what's different about kind of regulating at these different scales. And and one question I have for you, if I could maybe start off, and is thinking a little bit about this morning, Kathy was. Um, from the perspective of public health is the different kind of way in which something like expert knowledge, right, plays out at different jurisdictional scales, right? And so we talked a bit about the urban toy case and the way in which, you know, we kind of see different evidence being brought to bear there and thinking about how a public health professional would, um, you know, want to craft the ideal regulation and at what scale. Maybe a very different answer than how the law kind of polices, you know, those kinds of regulations. At different scales. Absolutely. Yeah. So why don't I talk a little bit about the the parameters of the scale of, uh, of what's being governed in terms of Irwin Toy, and then I'll introduce the two versions uh, of the bill, of the Senate bill. Uh, so the key parameters in that case were, um, in Irwin Toy, it was uh, the, the government of Quebec within the context of its, uh, uh, of really protection of, 
commercial protection, uh, in terms of uh, preserving the rights of consumers uh, within, a, within, a, within that context. Um, to protect what was really a vulnerable population. And the vulnerable population defined at that time was uh, uh, children 13 years and under. And the nature of the, uh, the harmful kind of exposure was deemed to be advertising. Uh, but again, like I really want to point out that it wasn't necessarily because of, of food, although subsequent public health people have interpreted in that way, uh, really around the food and nutrition uh, outcomes. At the time, it was really the idea that all advertising is by nature manipulative to that vulnerable population uh, of, of that, that vulnerable child population. So when the, if we look at the two versions of the Senate bill and think about the, the federal scale, uh, the federal government had declared a healthy eating strategy and embedded in the uh, minister's letter was a promise to address childhood obesity, including a number of uh, healthy eating policy initiatives that were related to this. Uh, and restricting marketing of food and beverages to children uh, was defined as part of enacting that healthy eating strategy on the part of the federal government. So it was really the idea of the scope of all children in Canada, uh, the, that children in Canada were facing uh, a, a major health problem which was defined specifically as obesity and we can talk a little bit about that like whether that's kind of the scope of the problem that we want to define uh, and that the federal government could very much do something about this problem of childhood obesity by protecting children uh, from advertising or from marketing uh, and the the age level that was set at the first version of the bill was 13 years of age by the third version of the bill, it was, uh, or the amendments to the bill, uh, ch switched that to 17 years of age, so it was determined that the age of vulnerability was 17 and under. Um, the definition of marketing was increased from only advertisements to all forms of marketing, acknowledging that how uh, diverse the marketing has become. and. Uh, the marketing, with the exception of trademarks, which were removed as a particular area that would not be covered uh, by the bill. Right, right. And I wonder, um, given the experience, you know, of the bill itself that kind of dies on the, the order paper, um, uh, if you had to kind of advise, you know, on, on how to achieve this outcome, do you still have confidence that that federal scale is the right way to do it? Or do you think that there is other scales of governance that, you know, are potentially more you know, effective. So this is exactly yeah, where, yeah. where you raised the alternative yeah. to. So there's a number of different, if we want to actually, uh, if we want to promote the ch health of children through kind of providing access to healthier food, one way to do it is to restrict exposure to unhealthy exposures, and that was into the intent of the bill. But another way is at the local scale, right. which was the example that you raised. Right, in Montreal. And so, I mean, one of the things that's really interesting about the kind of comparison of, you know, this initiative that kind of dies at the federal level and then one that, you know, recently gets upheld at the local level, you know, you could ask this question in you know, very straightforward terms, then should we take a lesson from this to be, well, we ought to focus our energy on cities, right? Um, as opposed to, you know, advocating at a national level. Now, you know, we could talk a little bit in, in about like the, the, the kind of pros and cons of that kind of strategic perspective in light of when, how the law approaches it from, you know, from, from this point in time. Certainly it would seem that a national initiative, you know, with national reach um, is the most effective kind of strategy, right? That a municipal or many municipal kinds of actions is going to play out differently in different localities. It's going to require in some ways probably a lot more resources to have kind of some kind of coordinated approach to be able to get to some outcome, you know, from any big population scale kind of uh, effect of this. And yet the lesson of the kind of recent cases seems to be that um, there's been somewhat more success at the local level in kind of seeing uh, some of these initiatives go forward. And so if you can use local land use law or zoning law to restrict children's access to fast foods, that seems in part like a kind of plausible strategy to kind of focus at the local scale. 
So my, my question, back, kind of back to you, Jamie, is how important is that direct relationship between the outcome that we want to achieve, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is restricting kind of children's exposure to this harmful uh, item, which yeah. we've defined as unhealthy food and beverages, yeah. Um, yeah. which we would have to apply some kind of criteria to. Yeah. How important is kind of that direct uh, regulation of that exposure yeah. as compared to an indirect regulation yeah. of that exposure? Yeah, I think this is a really good question. And one of the things that um, I think you get from a, a reading of like local law as opposed to national law is that local law at that scale often operates kind of sideways, right? And so, you know, what zoning restrictions do is, you know, purport to regulate land use in a kind of, often in a pretty neutral frame, right? So it's really about what land uses can exist in this part of the city, what land uses are restricted in this part of the city, and, and often those laws are not very uh, specific about their particular objective. So about restricting uh, children's access to, you know, unhealthy foods or fast foods, for example. And, and the point in part here is that law, actually local law, municipal law, and when courts go to review municipal law legislation, they often accept that. Right? They have to accept that local law kind of operates in this kind of sideways manner, uh, an indirect manner to get to some particular outcome, but that it can do it with these tools that often don't seem particularly well suited toward that. And a big question in the Montreal case comes up is, is local government even allowed to really regulate food as a regulatory subject, right? Local governments, we normally think about them, you know, about taking out your garbage or about, you know, preventing a high-rise building next to your single-family detached home. And when we come to a regulatory subject like food, uh, courts are struggling, right, with trying to understand whether or not and how municipalities even have a role uh, in actually regulating that particular area. And the question is, what is the right kind of target? I, I, can, yeah. I can't kind of help but like get into our yeah. kind of second theme yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, I can't yeah, so. kind of stay at the governance level yeah, yeah. Um, uh, too long, yeah. but it's but the idea is, you know, is food the appropriate subject? for a municipality, or should we use the other appropriate subjects that the municipality has kind of a jurisdiction over in order to kind of indirectly access the food? Yeah, yeah. Like is the food the problem or the solution? I yeah, guess. yeah, yeah, I think this is a good question. And I think, um, you know, in part, uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about the end case in, result, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in response to this kind of particular question, because you know, there you get this really interesting result, and a member describes to you that this is the case where the city of Toronto enacted a ban on shark fins, right? As a food product, right, that gets consumed in Toronto, uh, gets um, uh, transacted or bought and sold in Toronto, and, and, and that, you know, that restaurants and, 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 and importers that were possessed, um, and that all of that activity is going to be banned under this bylaw um, by the city of, of Toronto. Um, and one of the things then that the court is doing in that case is trying to figure out what power does the municipality have in order to kind of regulate this food product, this food in, in this space, toward and toward what what goal? Um, and so they, they move between these different frames, and this is really relevant, I think, for us today, is whether or not this is a health objective. Um, you know, and, and in the city of Toronto's empowering statute, it says that the city of Toronto can regulate for the health and well-being of people that live in Toronto, um, or is this a kind of environmental um, uh, uh, regulation? Is this about the health of people in Toronto, or is it about the sustainability of shark populations in far off oceans? Right, and here we suddenly see another dimension of scale really playing into this question of which is the international, subject. right? Which is, and also like, can a city deal with a problem like this through regulating food that is ultimately at least in big part about regulating something that doesn't even happen within the territorial boundaries of the municipality? Right? And so what the court does in Ang is it uses that idea about territory, about space, to kind of push down the municipality to cabin its jurisdiction and say, no, you can't regulate sharks in far off oceans. That has nothing to do with the city. And the city is responding, and their arguments are very much in the frame of, it has everything to do with the city, in part because, one, you know, sharks are apex predators, and if we drive sharks to distinction, that's going to have dramatic global environmental consequences for everyone, including people that live in Toronto, and two, people in Toronto eat a lot of fish, and so even if we're not talking about and are uncertain about the kind of catastrophic impacts of, of shark populations, if it's just really about oceans, you know, you can't buy the salmon sobeys down the road, then people in Toronto are still affected in terms of their food choices and, and so forth. Um, now, none of those arguments went out for the court because they simply regard this as a matter of space, right? If you're either outside or inside the city altogether. So, you know, so, food does this dual role there, I guess. And the public health, or the city argument was very, when I, when I read Aang yeah. with the public health kind of 
glasses to it, it really occurred to me that this is the type of argument, like the city was making arguments that public health people made make all the time, yes. uh, which uh, alerted me that this is actually a pitfall for potentially in our public health reasoning, uh, which was the city argued that because citizens of Toronto were local residents, but also, you know, global residents with a part to play uh, in the larger global society and environment, that they were, that there was a two-way kind of relationship between the residents of Toronto and this global environment and global concerns that the city had jurisdiction over. Um, but that didn't, that didn't hold up. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think, you know, partly it illustrates an interesting difference between, again, getting back to our kind of national and local law. I mean, traditionally, courts have been very skeptical about, um, you know, this kind of question about how municipalities can operate and what kind of concerns they can bring within their purview. And so they've used these kind of territorial boundaries in this way to, to try to kind of cabin them and, and, and do that kind of work. Um, and you see that really coming out in the result in the, in the end case, despite the fact that much of the case law over the past 20 years or so about municipalities has said, we ought to be kind of pushing municipalities up. We realize that cities, for example, are global actors. You know, they're not just local actors. Toronto gets together with New York, gets together with London, gets together with Milan to regulate climate change, to be involved in uh, you know, there's something called the Milan Food Pact, in which cities are interacting with one another on a global scale to try to mark out their place in regulating the food system, right? Skipping over boundary questions about jurisdictions. So. Absolutely. So it, it, enacting that uh, network form of governance yeah. that we often talk about uh, yeah. in policy yeah. now. Yeah. Um, I wanted to kind of go back also to the uh, marketing to kids uh, bill that that died on the order paper. Uh, so a really contentious aspect of the bill. Um, for which an amendment was made was the original version of the bill prohibited all uh, marketing of foods and beverages, period. Uh, and an alteration was made to change that to unhealthy food and beverage uh, marketing. So within, which leads us kind of naturally to the question, then how uh, do we define uh, what constitutes unhealthy food and beverages versus healthy food and beverages? And this, I think this comes up and plays into this idea of scale of governance because uh, adding that unhealthy food and beverage, the solution was actually an administrative one. It was a regulatory state one that uh, Health Canada was already exploring uh, issues within food labeling and also uh, around nutrient profiling systems recommended by other uh, governments or have, that have been adopted by other governments or have, that have been proposed as a standard uh, by the WHO and therefore that this could be a really practical solution uh, for addressing that issue of unhealthy uh, food and beverages that the definition could play right into what was already being done and captured within federal bureaucratic or administrative jurisdiction. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just maybe I'll move to the second slide because I think partly we were also talking about here on the example of the food advertising, um, you know, kind of the kind of legal frameworks that um, probably the Senate almost invariably was anticipating when they were thinking about, you know, the, the, the scale and the scope of the way that these particular regulations are being drafted. And, and thinking back to the Erwin Toy case that, that Kathy was referencing earlier, that eventually something like this is going to have to survive a proportionality analysis, right? And so you know, many of you, just like the law students and, and lawyers in the room, will be familiar with the proportionality analysis. That is to say, um, this stage of constitutional review under the uh, charter, uh, once a rights infringement has been found, so in the case of Erwin Toy, an infringement is on the right to free speech, um, uh, whether or not that's a justified infringement in a free and democratic society. And, and integral to that analysis is a proportionality analysis, as the court uh, calls it. And the basic point here is that, uh, from our lens, you know, proportionality is all about scale, right? It's about scaling the different elements of uh, the, the benefits and harms, uh, as it were, the benefits of the state's action in these cases, the harms to the right on the individual, uh, and defining, as it were, the target of the individual in the first place. Is it 13 years old and under? Is it 17 years old and under, and so forth? And so the proportion of the Mali analysis, um, you know, in Irwin Toy, and is, in this case we can imagine, is operating, uh, is using scale, right, to kind of um, uh, calibrate uh, and, and decide ultimately the validity or constitutionality of these endeavors. And the pieces that are often kind of pulled together in public health formulations, I think, 
um, uh, but that really are very much kind of separated when we kind of take a law perspective to it are the pieces of the target of the uh, legislation as compared to the beneficiary of the regulation. So when I talk about the target of an intervention or talk about the target of a policy uh, in public health class, and I often talk about really what we're talking about is whose behavior are we inducing uh, to change. So, and in the case of um, an advertising restriction, um, it's really we're infringing upon uh, corporations as a person um, that their freedom of expression, but that's justified because, but the beneficiaries are intended to be the children. The benefits will accrue to uh, the children. So, the question also to me from a public health perspective is. Whose, whose harms kind of matter more and to what extent do we believe in the magnitude of harm to each party right. seems to be really important. Right, right, um, absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and that there is, I think, when the courts go to answer those questions, often, um, let me give you just one example of, of a kind of inherent tension in the way that the law comes to that, particularly from a section one house, right? So we were talking earlier about the idea, and you know, again, those of you who know the kind of section one jurisprudence, there are these two elements to that uh, analysis, right? It's about uh, the rational connection uh, between the regulatory action and, and, and the outcome, and then there is minimal impairment of the right. And so the rational, minimal impairment piece attempts to kind of scale down or scale back the regulatory invention, right? Kind of tailor it to the, um, the objective that's also being, that's being realized. Um, but that rational connection piece at the first part, I think, is like a sort of scaling out mechanism, right? That it's a way to kind of broaden out and define exactly what it is that the legislator is attempting to do. And that there's a kind of real interrelationship, obviously, between those two parts of the test that really operate along this context of scale. One is about how bigly is it where you define the problem and the objective, and the minimal impairment piece is how closely or some scale down do you tailor that to the potential harm upon the right. And so if we look at that from a scale perspective, Right? Um, I think it helps us to try to understand a little bit the interconnections between those elements of the analysis. Right? And also I think sometimes the contradictions that courts get into when they go to actually apply that. And from a public health perspective, when I, when I was reading Erwin Toy and thinking about the harms element, I was really struck in the judgment that the, they really didn't take up the argument that there would be kind of a harm to the corporation. Uh, on, you know, based on this uh, infringement. So it was that the company had, uh, could just find another method to market, and that's sort of what companies do, is very much part of that judgment. And I found that very revealing, um, because that's also a very common public health argument. Right, right, right. That there's some unknown or undefined alternative that ultimately exists. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's also, you know, I, we haven't talked too much about this idea, and maybe it goes back a bit to our previous slide about the kind of interaction between, you know, the kind of public authorities who might, you know, be involved in regulating this and the kind of private sector. And maybe this is a bit of a segue into our last piece in terms of thinking about, you know, kind of scale of enterprise. But just to give you an example of, you know, ways in which this kind of gets, gets left out of the story, back to the end case, shark fin regulation, um, there is actually an entity or a set of entities out there in the private sector that took the lead on banning shark fins or uh, trying to move forward uh, restrictions on shark fin markets um, that had to do with the transportation of those shark fins across national boundaries, and it was airline companies. And so particularly some of the East Asian airline companies um, that were operating uh, in and out of the countries where there's higher demand for um, uh, shark fins uh, enacted policies right, uh, that said they were no longer going to carry those um, uh, across national borders as part of the kind of import export process. And so, you know, again, kind of thinking about the ways in which you might build scales of advocacy or momentum around particular issues, my read about it actually starts in part with the airlines. They're the first movers, then it uh, comes from some of the municipalities, and maybe we ultimately get results at the national level. And then looping back up to the Senate bill, the question is, to what extent is that private sector innovation, I guess, uh, outside of having a law in place? Um, to what extent is that effective in achieving kind of your overall purpose for the legislation in the first place? And the argument uh, around marketing to children is that there has been a voluntary system of self-regulation 
uh, around companies, but there's been quite a bit of public health research around looking at the frequency and power of uh, marketing messages communicated underneath uh, the context of that voluntary self-regulation. And one of uh, my public health colleagues, Monique and Kent of the, the University, of Cal uh, University of Ottawa, uh, has found that actually those companies that were signatories to uh, the voluntary self-regulatory uh, pledge were more likely to advertise, or they had a greater proportion of uh, advertising in her uh, assessment of children's television advertising than did other companies. Right, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think this is kind of on this theme, uh, again, part of our kind of earlier discussions about what forms of kind of association or kind of collective action uh, when we're thinking about scale are, are actually most kind of effective, right? And so we asked the first question through the scales of governance. We've now kind of brought in, you know, alternative forms. Um, and so if we start thinking about all of the different possibilities of that, it kind of opens up our mind or makes us more alive to, um, you know, what those alternative modes of governance are. You know, we talk about this idea of network governance. So this is actually a really great segue, I think, into our last theme, which is scale of uh, enterprise and kind of the nature of that. But I'll just kind of explain the picture that I have on here. Um, we do retail food environment research, and this was this picture was from uh, an interactive workshop that we did. Uh, it was an intersectoral workshop in Newfoundland and Labrador to discuss what does a healthy retail food environment, or what does specifically a healthy corner store in rural Newfoundland and Labrador uh, look like. And we had people kind of write their uh, sticky notes of their ideas and then as a group we began to theme them. So this was the theme around store owner and staff attributes. Um, and if you can kind of read some of the sticky notes, I think this kind of gives you an idea of how people think of that corner store uh, at a very scalar level of the of the community, is it only kind of transactional, or is it does a commun does a community store provide a community service, or is it about the relationship between uh, there's a, there's one that says no judgment. Is it the relationship between the store owner uh, and the residents that shop at that store, or is it the fact that the store owner is a member of that community and therefore kind of can speak on behalf uh, of the community that do, that makes it healthy. Right. So this is the picture here. Yeah, this is, and I think you know, a major theme, of course, in, in kind of the food world generally, whether or not it's from a public health or legal or other perspective, is really all about localism these days, right? Um, and so whether or not it's access to kind of local foods or the significance of local production in you know our kind of communities and economies, um, what are the kind of health impacts and consequences? What are the consequences for um, you know addressing things like food insecurity or access to food? Um, uh, there are lots of the discussion centers around the local, which is, of course, a scalar concept here. And so, um, you know, one of the ways in which that kind of perspective on scale kind of, again, opens up the, 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 the set of questions um, is to kind of uh, understand that when, often when law attempts to intervene, and this maybe draws back to the food safety example, um, there is very differential effects on the scale of the enterprise um, for one purportedly neutral set of regulations. And so the critique in the example of the Healthy Food for, uh, Safe Food for Canadians Act, um, these new food safety regulations, is that that approach, as it often we call it, kind of risk um, uh, mitigating or, or risk centric approach. Now, food processors or food providers have to register with the CFIA, the Canadian Food uh, Inspection Agency. Um, they have to take preemptive measures to ensure that their um, businesses and whatnot are, are safe, and they have to ensure the traceability of their food throughout the supply system. Now, these all seem like really good ideas. They're meant to be kind of upstream measures that prevent food safety risks before that they occur. But the critique, right, on the scale perspective has very, of this regime has very much been that um, this is kind of highly biased against smaller producers, right, in which the regulatory burden of this kind of risk approach um, imposes disproportionately a lot upon small enterprises. It's probably one that larger enterprises um, uh, uh, are already well uh, tailored to, to, to address. And so um, uh, uh, there's a, a question, practical questions as to, how local businesses, how smaller businesses are going to be able to navigate uh, some of these new regulations um, uh, in a way that may you know, ultimately end up putting some of them out of business. 
And acknowledging the differential burden has really come up in other instances of food and nutrition uh, interventions that have come into play. So for example, in the case of menu labeling in Ontario, it was initially proposed uh, at a city level before it, uh, it was proposed at the provincial level. Uh, but that was very much where the parameters of uh, menu labeling were set so that only larger corporations uh, would initially have to comply and that there would be programmatic mechanisms or administrative and service mechanisms through the municipal government uh, to enable smaller enterprises to comply on a voluntary basis projecting that eventually uh, it would be more all-encompassing. Uh, and a similar thing happens around uh, say food in the city of Toronto around um, food handling regulations, so the, the requirement for at least one uh, managerial and one employee uh, uh, staff of a, of a food enterprise, a food selling enterprise, uh, to have food handler certification uh, was rolled out on a staged basis based on the scale of the enterprise. Right, right, right. And uh, coming back to your earlier point about you know the responses to, to this exercise and the role of things like community relationships and trust, right, is very much that those serve as the kind of basis or underpinning for you know advocates of you know kind of alternative regulatory regimes sometimes. So in the food safety example, that you know the reason why I consider food safe when I go to my local farm and I buy um, some meat that was butchered on site, um, or buy a mobile abattoir that goes out to that farm and, and does the butchering. Um, is because I trust the farmer and I know them, right? I have a relationship with them. Uh, that's the basis of my food safety regime, as it were, but that's a very different mode of governance at a very different scale than one that is, um, you know, provincially or nationally enacted and, 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 and uh, depends much more on these concepts of country and the risk. And what has been fascinating for me around the marketing to kids uh, debate, if you uh, looking through the Hansard uh, record of the Senate committee discussion around this, it was that some of the arguments around the differential impact for smaller businesses was often made by the largest uh, industry associations yeah. uh, speaking and were using those exemplars as an example of why the whole um, piece of legislation was uh, inappropriate. Right, right. And then just as a last example, kind of trying exactly on what Patty was just saying, I think is, is that's restaurant, um, uh, uh, the zoning regulation case I was talking about in Montreal earlier, uh, where the city of Montreal had enacted restrictions on the location of fast food restaurants near schools. One of the arguments that was made by the restaurant association challenging that bylaw was that it drew this kind of arbitrary distinction because the zoning only applied to restaurants without um, uh, table service. Uh, and so the consequence of that, which is really interesting, is that that exactly regulated out uh, Harvey's, A&W, and McDonald's, but it left in place the mom and pop shops who were serving, and this is the point made by the restaurant food, exactly the same food, right? They were serving hamburgers and fries, but if you had table service and you were, um, you know, Dave's Diner, then you weren't captured by the regulation. But because of this distinction, coming back to Ken's earlier point, that was you know, very much kind of a bleaker sideways. It was really about the distinction between table service or not, but that exactly that form served to regulate the scale of the enterprise that was all, uh, being captured by the zoning. And in our lab, we're, uh, we're actually doing a systematic review. It's led by uh, Nate Taylor, one of our PhD students, um, looking at how we even kind of typologize stores uh, within uh, public health research. Uh, on-store environments. So those those definitions for how we define, you know, a, an unhealthy environment as a as a as a non-table service restaurant uh, really matter both from uh, evidence collection perspective, uh, but also obviously from a, a legal perspective. So coming to the time, maybe we uh, will stop talking ourselves and, and open it up to take questions. I just have a comment to add to what you said about the table service thing. Yes. Um, I went to McDonald's like maybe two months ago, and they now have an option for table service. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So oh. I wonder if that, it, it was like in Northwestern Ontario, but I wonder okay. if that was like a way to sort of like okay. harass them. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. Because that's, of course, one possible response, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Can you speak a little bit to the whole sponsorship thing and bill us to 2 Oh, yes. Okay, absolutely. Um, so, the, uh, so what you're referring to is that uh, sponsorship, uh, so for example, um, uh, I guess the, the Tim Hortons hockey team, like sponsorship, 
uh, which is usually is actually not covered or was not covered uh, by uh, that legislation or was proposed to not be covered um, in, in kind of the latest state of where uh, the discussion was around that bill. Um, so the argument would have been that, that we would also have to invoke kind of other, this would have been a governance one, where we would have had to invoke the regulatory powers of other orders of government, provinces and municipalities, uh, presumably, uh, to deal with issues around uh, sponsorship. So, yeah, on the on you know recreation facility, uh, recreation facility, kind of the advertising that's around a hockey arena or on the jerseys uh, themselves. Um, so that was that was a, definitely a sticking point, but also unre unresolved, but probably not going to be included, and probably won't be included in future versions of the bill that comes back. As far as oh, now now this is also on tape. So as far as I know, <laughs> this this bill, um, I think there is great interest uh, in this. Uh, bill moving forward from kind of many, actually across and many parties. Um, I think that there is also an understanding that the direction in which the amendments went maybe created new, in an attempt to kind of um, address the potential uh, kind of looming charter challenge. Uh, I think that the amendments went in a direction that actually made it harder to adopt the bill in the first place. That that's kind of my read on the situation. Is there real evidence that advertising to children under thirteen makes the slightest bit of difference to remove it? Do we know that? We we absolutely know. We do know that. Uh, Advertising directed to children under 13, under 16, and under 17 in some studies can influence uh, almost every step, step along the pathway of consumption, including changing attitudes, changing perspectives around food and beverages, changing purchasing intent, changing actual purchases, and also changing uh, dietary intake of those food and beverages. So there's quite a detailed, um, there's, there's detailed evidence on all of those aspects of it. Um, and there's a nice, for those who are interested in reading further, there is a nice systematic review of the literature uh, on kind of breaking down uh, those pieces of evidence. So I can also send that around to the listserv uh, if that's useful for people. Um, but what has not been uh, uh, fully assessed in the evidence is uh, the way that marketing has changed and evolved. So a lot of the literature, to date the literature now is about 40% about tel te television advertising only. And if we think about television advertising, that's probably, I don't know, it's almost the last place that you start to think when you think about how any consumer good or, or service is now marketed. Uh, it's much more personalized. Uh, it's it's through many many other uh, different formats and especially digital marketing. I got a question, Jay. Um, yeah, thanks so much for the conversation format. I liked it. Um, you know, sometimes you listen to a conversation, you then join it in the middle, and you say, "Oh, but what about this one?" Yeah. So, so I think what's interesting is that um, three questions of scale, scale of governance, intervention, enterprise, but then I noted, and it got buried into the three conversations, but like scale of problem, yeah. like, yeah. Oh. right, like that's the first thing, like what is this about? And it's interesting to think about scale because even in your conversation you went that the problem was from nutritional properties to ocean flows, <laughs> you know, like yeah. in trying to think about what is the thing here? What is the nature of the underlying issue? And I think you kind of, it's interesting to say it's about health or healthy foods because that is a really big assumption to begin with versus that this is a problem of so many other that you could pitch it at different questions at the outset. 
So I thought the scale of the problem is an interesting one to start. And, and then my second question is, children are such an interesting thing, and I really say thing, because <laughs> in policy debates, they are a thing. They are a thing. So I started to think about children in a sense of scale. Like, why focus on children? Is it scale because future outlook, right? So like nutritional, nutritional policy is really important because of the effect that it will have over a lifetime or like what's, is it a time scale thing? Is it a scale with respect to children because of this vulnerability question? And so what is indeed the vulnerability if you think of a place or space question with children? What is the source of vulnerability? And it's quite interesting because it targets these private actors, the marketers, as the source of the vulnerability. When in truth, when we think about children and what makes them a vulnerable class, it's not just the threat of these private marketers. It's they rarely buy their own food, especially at a certain age, right? Um, and so there's all this other, there's family, there's the parents, there's the entire school, right, and looking at it in orientation to school, who controls school. So I wondered, like, children themselves is an interesting scalar concept, yeah, uh, to think about why these food regulations have such this obsessive quality with children. Yeah. Um, do you have? Oh, well, let me do just start, yeah, let me just start with you. I mean, a couple of points. I, I think this is a great point, Joan. I think on the first one, right, in terms of, um, you're kind of thinking about the definition of the problem, and it kind of comes back to the, what I kind of started in our introduction to say, this whole idea of food or food law, right, as the kind of framing for these problems has become, you know, one that like lawyers and, 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 and legal researchers are increasingly interested in, um, uh, and, and is relatively new to them. Um, but I always have these anxieties, actually, about that whole project in part, uh, because it, for me, kind of on this question of like, what does it bring to us to kind of, because it's, big, it, it's, it's implicit, I think, in defining something as a food problem to, to scale it up in part, right? It makes it very big and food, and, and we now want to talk about food systems. We don't want to just necessarily talk about disconnected issues of consumption or processing or production or waste flows and so forth. But the enormity of the way in which the problems kind of come at you and the complexities when you kind of adopt that lens I think is, is, is challenging. And I never know how to answer the question, or I haven't yet figured out the answer to the question of how do you kind of fit that with our more established categories of law, right? Which which all, which bring their own problem definitions along with them. And so, you know, the idea is to give you an example of you're moving between these frames. This is a health question, is it an environmental question, is it other aspects of community well-being? Um, and I think partly in that case, the court's ability to actually move between those is part of the move the court makes in order to actually you know, render this bylaw, you know, ultra virus outside of the kind of scalar scope of the, the municipality. Um, so I guess I'll just say that like, your question I think is about ones I would say is like anxiety I have about what does it mean to sort of adopt something they call food law? Is that a useful way to go about kind of thinking these problems because of, you know, partly the scale issues implicit in the, dis the disciplinary definition? The practical, I mean, the practical objective also of public health is like public health. So there is a tendency to kind of have health as the objective. And I even kind of put that at the beginning uh, of our, of our uh, talk today as that's something that we assume that everyone does want to achieve. But the Ottawa Charter on Health Promotion said that health is not the outcome that's desirable, but health is a resource for everyday life. So that health actually confers you an advantage uh, to function in society and to achieve all of the other things uh, that you would like to achieve. So maybe health is not the right outcome uh, to be framing uh, when we're talking about some of these problems. And really, I think that's what the, why the earlier Quebec legislation was successful. Just add one more point on, on Judge last piece about thinking about kids in this example. And, and so this morning, my son um, was uh, making pretend granola bars. And he, he said to me, um, Dad, uh, mine is gluten free, but yours has Brussels sprouts and mine doesn't. Uh, and I just thought, like, it's kind of amazing actually how much he knows, or like the world which he lives in, about the kinds of food choices he's making is like very different from the world I feel like. I kind of grew up in, and that sort of thing, that like, you know, the choice that we make as a kind of family is a way that we kind of regulate food at that level. And I think it kind of goes back to the idea that when we think about actually jurisdiction and scale, and this is where some of the law and drivers, I think, are kind of pushing us to think, you, you know, your conventional lines of national, global, and local are actually insufficient. 
that we can actually think about jurisdiction as within the family, for example. We can think about it at all of these different scales, and probably what that scale of concept helps us to do is break out of these kind of more formal categories. I guess the other way of saying that is that scale is not actually the same thing as jurisdiction, but the lawyers tend to assume that that's so. Um, and uh, even though we might think about jurisdiction as a kind of technical concept that, that fits these categories, we might usefully actually think about a family as, as a jurisdictional entity and how that might help us then to maybe answer some of these questions. And the dissent, on, so and my thought on the ch child aspect of it is the dissent on Erwin Tolle says that it was really like children grow up to be adults. So, you know, this is a nuisance for now, but w w we, we anticipate that this, that, that over time, kind of introducing the time scale that we talked about, we, we didn't kind of really get into, that children eventually acquire those abilities. So, in a way, the, the setting of an age to define that class of vulnerability is arbitrary, and that is also recognized. think about that I think hasn't really been resolved very well or it doesn't kind of receive equal attention in the food sovereignty compensation is also because of its origin. It um, Talking about kind of access to and purveying of food or, uh, or kind of one's ability to control, like have kind of sovereign jurisdiction over one's own kind of access or ability to purvey and provide for oneself, so there's a provider conversation, but then there's also a consumption uh, piece of that, and I feel like because the origin of that food sovereignty discussion was on the pro provision side of things, it has, has uh, it's been hard to kind of take up in more nutrition and consumption oriented uh, discussion. Maybe I'll just also say, because Mary, your question opens it up, and this is like an opportunity to take a bit more of a like stance on a question I asked Kathy earlier, which is about like, you know, where do you think the most effective kind of points of intervention are on some of these issues? I think we often undervalue the significance of acting at the municipal and local level. And I think that's in part because we've lost um, 
some sense of what municipalities and, and local governance is really about, right? That we just think about it as another level of the state. With a different set of capabilities and a certain set of delegated powers that get regulated by the courts and that we find in you know, the Municipal Government Act of Nova Scotia or the Halifax Charter. But um, there are all alternative ways of thinking about you know, the city or about local government that I think in the frame of consultancy can break us out some of the ways in which we get at that. Let's say local government is a original formulation and we still think about them as corporate entities. That is, it's alternative forms of association outside of the state individual kind of dynamic. I and mean, so, you know, to the extent that we can recapture some of that understanding in law and in practice by, you know, kind of taking action at the local level or through the uh, vehicle of municipal government, I think that actually already presents us with a way to, to take some of those actions. It's not simply operating at a different scale in the sense of, you know, it's closer to home or it's, you know, it's a more piecemeal approach than a national level approach, but you think that it represents a part of a different kind of governance, or at least the possibility of a different kind of governance. And I think the municipal uh, intervention also offers us an opportunity to transcend some of the scalar issues that we were talking about or combine them in unique ways because kind of inherent to living in a municipality is the idea of existing in a local community and environment in which individuals are mobile and constantly moving uh, through that environment in a, in a physical and also a temporal sense, so how they create uh, their space, like pathways through those spaces. And perhaps when we're designing law, we don't kind of need to think of populations as bodies of kind of eaters or as providers, but we need to think about how the populations themselves are moving through these uh, scales. Right, right. And then, yeah, that's exactly right. And then also, like, what those scales, how do we define them in, you know, in sensible ways? You know, so we talk about something that's of a food shed, right, coming out of the natural resource that's drawn a watershed, right, that maybe we should think about scales at the level of the resource, as it were, whatever that kind of means in the food world, as opposed to maybe some of these more arbitrary distinctions about local, provincial, or national. Yeah. And probably because it's dynamic idea that people and things move through the system. We still have a little bit of time. There are other questions? <laughs> I'm just curious. So, like, talking at the municipal level and about crafting policy that has indirect approaches or indirect implementation, and this is probably kind of a bit of yes and no, but. If you could discuss maybe if there is more or less danger to doing that in terms of unintended consequences. So this idea of like at Montreal or the shark fin legislation, we're going through indirect instrumentations. Like in terms of the shark fin, maybe I target something that it's a retailer that serves shark fins, but it's not necessarily based on shark fins itself. But then I'm targeting a wider swath mm -hmm. of the population. And not just there, like there's an answer. Yeah. I'm just curious if you can like discuss that a little bit. There is a there I would say that there is a risk to that, but it occurred to me when I was thinking about the shark fin uh, case. Uh, in Toronto, that an argument was made that the municipal bylaw was uh, discriminatory uh, towards Chinese businesses as the main purveyors, uh, or in Chinese communities as the main purveyor of the shark fin, uh, and that, like, it was interesting to me that that, that did not hold up, and I wasn't sure if it was in the in the way the argument was made, or just because. So in part of that's, I mean, it's an interesting point in the sense that, um, as a matter of the case, no charter claim is brought. No, of course, it's a complete possibility, right? That is to say, you could bring a, a, a Section 15 claim, an equality claim, um, pursuing on that basis uh, against the city, and yet the claimants don't. Um, they challenge the law as ultra-virus, right? It's outside of the jurisdiction of the municipality. And it's always a big question to me is why that wasn't included as part of the, the claim. I think part of the answer may well be just because they assume that actually courts, you know, that's a kind of big law kind of idea, right? That formally that's available, but that the way to get at this bylaw, which it turns out they're right about, which is to get at what courts are generally concerned about with these policies, that they're acting outside of their delegated powers, right? Um, and that uh, a charter claim maybe just, and it wasn't worth making or wasn't going to be successful, they didn't, they didn't want to focus on that because um, that's not the way in which kind of courts see and kind of regulate municipal action in that way. Although, it still doesn't make a full answer as to why that simply wasn't, it wasn't even addressed as a kind of collateral issue in, in the case. Um, despite the fact that that seems like a clear line of argumentation that yeah. the claimants 
uh, your thinking, but it may represent this idea that you know, once you move to different scales, there are different forms of law that seem to make more or less sense depending on what kind of scale you're, you're operating at. Now, I, mean, I also think that the question about you know, this worry about the way in which, around right this idea that local law operates in a different way, right? Um, uh, what the concern of kind of doing that would be. And of course, you know, we, we often think about the zoning laws in particular uh, and the history of zoning laws as a kind of tool of exclusion of communities. Right? That often what zoning laws did was that they were they were created to exclude particular individuals. Some of the early cases that laundry facilities weren't allowed in this part of town appeared to regulate simply land uses, but were in fact in these cases were a way of in fact regulating Chinese Americans out of particular neighborhoods. And they were you know only thinly veiled discriminatory local regulations. But that because municipalities operate through this category of land use, it becomes this really kind of easy cover for doing lots of other things that they're trying to, to get at. Now, you know, part of the question here, and it's it's actually true in the Montreal case, that's kind of also what's happening, but we might argue to where the much better regulatory objective, which is banning kind of fast food restaurants near schools, right? That they're still doing it through the category of land use, they're still drawing the kind of distinctions that municipalities draw, which is about um, the uses of the space. Is it restaurant table service? or is a restaurant without table service, but they're using that lever to more some kind of broader regulatory end. Now, you know, the question whether that's good or bad, I don't know, is a, a difficult one, but it's like a repurposing of the problem that we often think about in the municipal context. And I think it's, it's so that's where it's incumbent on a public health researcher to, to actually propose looking down the pathway of the intended and unintended consequences and to build like an evidence base around that to say these are the potential differential impacts like if you're taking a health equity lens in mind uh, which is yeah what are the differential impacts for different subpopulations uh, and to build that into the original legislation i think it's also a great question actually for, for public health in particular is, is what role public health as actors in these cases and disputes actually play right and there's actually a really interesting uh, here again, comparison, go back to the end case uh, on shark fins. Um, looking at the city council debates in the record in that case, um, when the, they were debating and trying to figure out whether or not they should pass this regulation, the city has hearings, and then we think cities are pretty good at participatory governments in this way, you know, opening up council meetings, that because they're local governments, people can actually go to the town hall and make their voices heard. Um, but who are the experts, or at least just one expert that they cite in that case? It's a little chef. Uh, it's not a public health expert about the harms of potential neurotoxins that um, are associated with consuming shark fin or shark meat. It's a, it's a chef who, who is kind of getting at some of those ideas, and the court picks up on that, starting down the bio to say, this person isn't a public health expert. Um, this person uh, is a chef. Yeah, yeah. and so you know, they're kind of trying to use this yeah. local event knowledge and trying mm -hmm. to figure out what the right choice of the community is, but the court uses exactly that evidence to strike down the bylaw. Right, and it's pretty fascinating to, to see um, uh, that is the kind of role of expertise, as it were, in, 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 in figuring out those. So that goes back to your original question: is kind of whose knowledge and who's like the kind of the role of uh, expertise yeah, yeah. in this in defining those different categories is, is absolutely salient. And should it be like members of the community um, who are closest to that, or should it be public health or or someone else, right. local chefs? Even the fact that lots of, sorry, lots of, of course, often you know, people listen to section one analysis get all kinds of after evidence, and then they say at the end of the day, well, we're just not sure, sure so there's a margin of appreciation here in any event. Uh, you know, it's, it's the question of certainty that comes through, you know, the deployment of social science evidence or expertise is always, I think, an open question to pick, you know, regardless of the scale of the problem. Great, that's a nice uh, way to end. For the questions. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so on behalf of everyone here, let me just thank you so much uh, for including us in your conversation. It was great. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.